just took the turn off to Devil Hills and Devil Springs and the country changed again. Left and right we have dunes but here in that swale is pretty much all very deep green bushes and that's some very soft sand here. I think we took a wrong turn though. I'm not sure where that brings us here. The trek into Diebel Hills is 20 kilometers one way, so you need to take that into account with your fuel consumption. The sand is very soft, so you will use more fuel. And the western side of the Diebel Hills is very overgrown and has some really painful pinstriping. So, making our way, trying to find the Diebel Springs. Not sure whether there's water in there. But landscape wise, it is stunning. Hard to see, but there are some indigenous carvings, I would think. It may be the spring because there comes water out there. At the end, there is actually a puddle, so you could get a good drink if you needed to. There's more water coming out here. Pretty amazing. It's a fair walk actually to the pool. And we're still searching for that water hole. It's a bit further than we thought. And it is reasonably warm, but the scenery is compensating. I reckon. I have given up. Can't seem to find it, even though I have a location. But the location now shows it's on top of the hill. The two hours of bush bashing or walking, trying to find Devil Springs without much success. We're now driving to the end of this track, which yeah, doesn't seem to be that well traversed. A lot of dingo tracks here though. And yeah, no idea where it brings us because it's a one-way track. So hopefully at least to a nice camp spot. Clouds are pretty dark all around us. Keen to see whether we're gonna get some rain tonight. Hopefully not, because we crossed a few creeks here. Mexican chili with organic beef. I think I have the Moroccan style wild venison and the beef comes tomorrow. The water. Mmm, that smells nice. I love that Moroccan flavor. So, I don't know whether you can hear rain in the desert. I just put the awning up quick. So that's Dave's emergency shelter. He's tapping it up. Cool. Let's see how much rain we get, Dave, huh? We just managed to pack in, kind of, before some more rain. Quickly have a coffee here. Yeah, we found uh, the Diebel Springs. To be honest, I don't think there are springs because there was no water in it. But uh, it would be magnificent with water. It's quite a creek coming down from the escarpment. A bit rough to drive in there, a bit hidden away. But yeah, I'm looking forward to maybe one day see that with water. That would be awesome. The landscape around it is crazy. It's like boulders thrown around everywhere and boulders of size of houses. Um, yeah, it looks amazing. It has been fairly recently burned though, so yeah, keep that in mind. It's a lot of uh, burned.
burnt wood steaks which stake your skin but yeah well worth it in my book even though yeah the trek in it's fairly rough past that big cave I really want to have a quick look and see. I really uh, love that country here it is just so beautiful hello someone home hey Frank um, you know who you are thank you very much for all the tips and Debel Hill certainly was an excellent tip um, it is a bit rough getting out here you need to have some extra fuel and uh, we didn't see a single soul here but in my book well worth a trip um, yeah absolutely stunning uh, countryside here. Durba Springs. Grass. It's the first time I've seen grass in a while. Water fairly low. We won't be swimming. But it's a lot of E. coli in. There's funny ants. They don't seem to be incredibly busy. They just do their business, whatever that is. While on one hand Durba Springs is a beautiful place, on the other hand I constantly felt I'm in a Sydney National Park. It just didn't feel like the desert and the remoteness. I'm not sure whether it was the bollards and they what looked like manicured grass, but uh, yeah that feeling never left me. Well, we're just driving out of Durba Springs in the rain. We're on another spring search adventure this time. For Bela Springs. Just went to the park up, supposedly, for half an hour walk. Certainly, there's a little bit of water here, in comparison to many of the other places. There's a bit of a walk in. Supposedly, at the end, it's a pool if you climb over one rock. But I'm not so sure. I'm not sure if we didn't walk far enough, but we didn't end up finding the pool. left of well 16 not much nicer camp though uh, how the old wells looked see all the wood on the side <coughs> well 15 Look out close to well 15. Uh, there's not too much left of well 14 Jin Jima. I often run the Ultra Vision front light bar. Um, yeah, much easier for people to see me, but uh, especially really I also want to see how they do when they're on with all the corrugation because it is some of the worst corrugation we have here at stretches and so far I haven't lost any of the LEDs so pretty happy with that 
Saturday morning. We just left our camp at well 13. Pushed pretty hard yesterday. Yeah, because the weather really was raining most of the day. Bulbomuro has now collapsed, but interestingly to know that between 1977 and 1984, the bottom of this well actually contained over 25 centimeter of natural oil, which had pushed its way up to the surface from below. Yeah, as you can hear, the corrugation are just shocking, and you just can't drive them slow. I mean, that is even worse, and we tested that a bit with my GoPro vibrations. So the best speed seems to be somewhere between 60 and 80. That's well number 12. Also restored. Fresh water. It is a bit fresh outside though. Another reason not to bring a trailer. Mind you, if you look at this one, the draw bar and so on, that certainly was very ill suited. Bit of rain coming down again. In 1929, parts of Snell Commission was to look for aircraft landing strips every 50 miles or so. He considered that this lake bed, when dry, would make a suitable landing surface, so called it aerodrome. There are many more burned out vehicles along the canning as we found, but that is one Land Rover. Not much left of the body, all the aluminium melted. But Dave already put his hand up for the bull bar. Make it fit for the rangey. It was at this well that in June 1906, during Canning's first survey, the third native guide bolted with a chain still locked in place around his neck. He was later found by Trotman in a native camp 40 miles away trying to cut the chains free. The remnants of the chains were removed and he was left with his people. My breakfast, Dave's lunch. What are you cooking, Dave? Some soup. Please tell me, how bad are the corrugations? Shocking. <laughs> like I said to you, no vehicle deserves that sort of abuse. <laughs> it's just shocking. Yeah, it's, the only way is fly over it, 60, 70. If you go slower, I think the car breaks apart. Yeah, it's, you just got to pick the right harmonic to sort of get over it with the least amount of impact. It's, uh, yeah, it's nuts how anything can survive that. I don't know. I reckon we get up here. Looks kind of like a trick. Some sort. Feeling like a mountain goat over the past couple of days. All these bouldery terrain. Wow, it's not bad. A quick update on the BFG KM3s. So we have now four fifths of the canning stock route done, as well as the Tenemai before, um, as well as Fraser. So I, I have used the tires a fair bit now and so far they held up pretty well. Um, the canning has some of the roughest terrain uh, you can imagine. Not so much if you stay on the main uh, canning, even though there you have very rocky terrain, you have sand, you have very sharp stones and you certainly have uh, scrubs and so on encroaching the track. But we decided to do a couple of side tracks, which is the old canning, and that area was partially burnt. Many times we didn't even have a track anymore, so we had to find the track. And we drove through a lot of burnt country. Burnt country means you have hardwood stakes, which are dried by the fire. 
So we are both actually very surprised that we made it through there uh, for kilometers on end without any puncture. Mind you, we have pulled quite a few splinters out of our tires, but um, yeah, that really was to expect it. Nothing has, has penetrated deep enough though. The BFG Scam 3 have worn very well. Can't really complain, no big chips out of it. They, they look pretty good. They obviously have a few nicks. I have two nicks in the sidewall somewhere. Can't find it now. Uh, here is one and one on the other side caused by a sharp rock but they haven't really penetrated any further yeah overall i mean i love the uh, bfg km2 and i had i don't know five or six set which i purchased over the time on all of my vehicles i still have a set of km2s on tiny on my land rover in 37s and they have gone through an absolute punishment and they're still good. So yeah, I, I really can't fault the tire. On sand, they are, in my opinion, a bit better than the Nido um, because they're a little bit softer. They don't dig that much. Uh, on the wet road, very good. Uh, I mean, considered it's a mud terrain tire, but never felt unsafe, uneasy there. On rocks, I have tested them now here. I mean, not crazy technical driving, but there were a few, you know, interesting sections. Um, no problem whatsoever. And yeah, I reckon the, the KM3 is pretty much, I mean, it's a success, successor of the KM2. And I rated the KM2 as the best overall touring tire. And so far, unless something major happens, I reckon uh, the KM3 has succeeded the KM2 there as, in my opinion, the best overall touring tire. There certainly is uh, are tires which are better in mud, you know, if you compare Simex or something like that, um, no doubt. But these is not, it's, it's not a tire for me to do competitions. That is my touring tire. That means it needs to be good on uh, tar and it needs to be good in the bush, whatever we see. We also had some mud, as you may still see here. So yeah, I can't really fault it. And um, I think I, I will definitely continue running uh, the BFG KM3, that's for sure. It's well 10. Yeah. water in there. don't think you can see it though. Yeah, we're slowly coming back into civilization. We're now passing through their farm territory, which uh, is allowed as long as we stay on the track. Just before well 11, we came across these, what seems to be a burnt cow. Um, yeah, there's still the horns and so left, but everything else is completely incinerated. Uh, yeah, I wonder how that happened. John Forrest and Tommy Pierre found the spring on June 2nd, 1874 and described it as one of the best springs in the colony. He called it Weld Springs after His Excellency Governor Weld, who assisted in the successful organization of the expedition. <laughs> On the 30th of June in 1874, Forrest and his party was attacked by around 60 indigenous people. They fended off the attack by shooting into the approaching indigenous people and then created a fort, which you see here, to protect themselves from further attacks. In the next and final episode, we will be exploring the Ingelbong Hills and find some amazing indigenous rock art we have a look at Windage Springs and Pier Springs. We encounter some of the few technical sections on the canning beside sand dunes. And see an amazing bloodwood tree. I will also provide the fuel and breakage statistics for both vehicles. Thanks a lot for watching guys. I hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. 
As always, I would greatly appreciate if you subscribe to my YouTube channel, like the video and leave me a comment in the comment section. My YouTube channel is completely self-funded and it takes considerable effort, time and money to create these videos. If you'd like to support me in this, please consider becoming one of my patrons on Patreon, where you can donate a small monthly contribution which will help me to cover some of the costs. For these, you will receive early access to all of my videos.